I'm going to largely talk about stuff that I do um, in the context of, uh, very interestingly, the name of your club, yeah, which is the Umwelt. So I decided at that point to sort of uh, uh, structure it around that. Okay. Right. So I'll just give you a little bit. So I work in animal behavior. So ethology is animal behavior. And I hope it will become clear as I go along why I call this the elusive holy grail. Okay. Um, so we begin as we begin many things with uh, Charles Darwin. Darwin, better known, of course, for his theory of evolution by natural selection. But Darwin also thought very hard about behavior. He thought about behavior of humans, he thought about behavior of animals, and rather than in The Origin of Species, it's really in these two books, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, where he first expounded the theory of sexual selection, and this much less read book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And it's in these two books that he sort of developed his ideas about, in some sense, what it means to be human, what it means to be not human, and what really is the difference. And I think he encapsulates it beautifully in this sentence which I'll quote, which is, the difference in mind between man and the higher animals, great as it is, certainly is one of degree and not of kind. If I had to think of a sentence that was really profound and summarizes his view of this, right? It is this sentence. And it sort of comes organically and naturally from the belief in evolution by natural selection, right? So if you believe in evolution by natural selection and if you believe that the different species that have existed have evolved from species that have come before, then humans have also evolved from species that have come before. And by extension, what that means, you know, we can't be something different than the rest of the organic world, okay? But he went further than that, okay? And he says, we have seen that the senses and intuitions, the various emotions and faculties such as love, memory, attention, curiosity, imitation, reason, of which man boasts, may be found in an incipient or even sometimes a well-developed condition in lower animals. Now that is a really bold statement to make because like many of his statements, it was rank speculation, right? So on what basis do you make a statement like this, all right? So he just puts out there in many ways what is his belief about the world, okay? And he doesn't really even hold it up to any kind of doubt, okay? So that's the way Darwin sort of put across his views of what he thought about mind, emotions, okay? Um, from that, I'm just giving you a little bit of history here. People started moving away in the early 1900s from these very, very subjective views, because these are very subjective views of behavior and of what animals might feel or think, okay, to a very much more objective analysis of behavior. What do we mean by that? Summarized by Jennings, describing the behavior of lower organisms we have used objective terms, those having no implication of psychic or subjective qualities. Okay, so we are describing behaviors, we're not worrying about what an animal might be feeling or perceiving. Okay, and here's another, to my mind, extremely important sentence, and this is said in the beginning of the 1900s, the peculiarity of subjective states is that they can be perceived only by the one person directly experiencing them, right? So even from human to human, you cannot experience exactly what I am experiencing, okay? And there's no easy way to get around that, okay? And therefore, 
Observation and experiment are the only direct means of studying behavior in the lower organisms, right? So you can observe behavior, you can manipulate, you can do experiments, you can see how behavior changes. Okay? Today you might even, you know, look inside the brain and see how the physiology changes. Okay? But can you ever really know what that individual is actually feeling or perceiving? Okay? I'll come back. We begin here and as you will see, I'll come back to it at the end. Okay? Um, just to draw your attention to someone who championed this kind of observational and manipulative study of behavior, this is Jean Rifab, remarkable man, remarkable entomologist who in many ways is the father of this kind of really objective study of behavior. He observed in his little patch uh, of ground where he lived for 40-45 years, insects in their natural state, fighting, eating, egg laying, you know, uh, metamorphosis, what have you, okay? And he has summarized these in a remarkable series of 22 volumes called the Souvenir Entomologie, of which some has been translated. And it's really, really, really beautiful reading because it's very rigorous observation um, of behavior. Okay? Uh, it's something I always get my students to read in my animal behavior course to get them to understand that modern thinking of behavior is not as modern as they think. Okay? Um, but when you watch animals, no matter how much you would like to think of them as automatons, okay, um, no matter how objective you might try to become, you cannot help but wonder, do non-human animals think? Do they feel emotion? But even more basically, what does the world look like to them? We only know what the world looks like to us. Okay? And this is again something that people have thought about for a very long time. And that in many ways is the concept of the umwelt itself. The world as experienced by an organism. Okay? And one of the people who thought hard about this was Jakob von Uxko. And he wrote a very interesting treatise on the tick, on the life cycle of the tick, but also wondered what might life look like and feel like from the perspective of a tick. Okay? As long as we study animals, we can only understand what we see, the observations that we make, if we manipulate, how does behavior change? Okay, but we can't really know what they feel. So, what is it like to be a wasp, a tick, or a cricket? Okay, so I'm going to take you through, switch tracks a little bit, and take you through some of the questions that we've been trying to ask. I'm obviously not going to answer this question. Okay. Okay. So I study communication in crickets. And this is just a little, little bit, and I promise you to be the only real straightforward natural history kind of slide. Um, to tell those of you in the audience who may not know what crickets are, uh, what they are. They're jumping insects, okay? And jumping insects, or autoptera, are divided into two groups, the crickets and the grasshoppers, okay? Why are crickets interesting? Why are crickets interesting to someone who studies communication. They're interesting simply because there's very large numbers of species of crickets who actually communicate with each other using sound. They're also the first, they're a very, very old group of animals evolutionarily, along with cockroaches, okay? They're among the first insect groups to have evolved on Earth, and interestingly, probably the first group to actually evolve communication using sound, okay? Um, there's very large numbers of species, many of them who still continue to communicate using sound, but they are the conservatives to end all conservatives because 
All crickets produce sound by rubbing their wings together, so they haven't changed the way they make sound. All crickets have their ears on their legs. More about that later. And just for you to understand bits of this talk, um, there are subgroups of these. There are true crickets, like these little black and brown guys that you hear singing everywhere, basically in almost any environment. Then there are what are called the katydids or the tetigonids, the bush crickets. These are the green or sometimes brown guys. They usually, some of them are bigger and usually their wings are, you know, the true crickets look more like cockroaches. They're flattened like this, but the bush crickets are laterally flattened. That's how you tell them apart. And apart from these two main groups, there's a group called the Grillacridoids, which basically is the group into which taxonomists dump everything that doesn't fall here or here. So basically, it's a, it's a mishmash group. Okay, I'm only telling you this because I may use these terms later in the talk. So, first of all, in what context do crickets use sound? Typically, crickets use sound to attract mates. And usually only adult male crickets sing. I don't know how well you can see this. This is a painting from the 1700s of a cricket singing at its burrow. Okay. And there's a female who's approaching him. And you can see she's a female because she has this egg-laying apparatus, the ovipositor. So he's singing at the mouth of the burrow. She is approaching him. And this is typically what crickets use their calls for, okay? And you can do an experiment if you make a sound recording and you play it out in the field and you can see this experiment was done a very long time ago from the size of the speaker, okay? You can attract females of that species in the field to a speaker. So basically these calls are good enough on their own to attract things. <coughs> Given this, and as I told you, there are large numbers of species, the songs themselves are species specific. So each cricket species has its own unique song. And I'm just put these two up to illustrate. And let me play it to you. Oh. So if we made a recording and we're actually able to visualize this, and you can do this, I don't know how many of you, most of you probably know enough physics for all this, but you can visualize this as an oscillogram, so you have time on this axis and you've got your sound level or amplitude on that. And you can see these discontinuous chirps and you could hear them as well, okay? But what you see when you actually look at it is that there are two levels of organization, right? There are the chirps, but the chirps themselves are actually made up of smaller units called the syllables. That's the fundamental unit. And that fundamental unit comes from one wing rub. So every time the cricket rubs a wing, it will produce one syllable. So just looking at this, you can tell how often it opened and closed the wings to make this pattern, okay? So in a chirping cricket like this, you do one, two, three, four, pause, and then you do one, two, three, four again. In a trilling cricket like this, you just keep opening and closing your wings. Okay. So there's a one-to-one -one relation between the syllables, the timing of the syllables, and the wing movements, because the wing movements actually produce the syllables. Closing produces sound, opening is silent. So these are what we call the rhythm or the temporal features, okay? So 
you can have, for example, the durations of these chirps or the rates of these chirps, similarly durations of syllables, rates of syllables. And you could imagine that these could vary, and they vary to species, but they're remarkably conserved within a species. Okay? Similarly, if you look at the pitch, and the way you can look at it is by constructing a power spectrum. So a power spectrum basically tells you how the different frequencies in the sound are distributed, uh, or the energy of, uh, across the different frequencies, how the energy of the sound is distributed across different frequencies. And this peak means that most of the sound is at one frequency. That's why it sounds so uh, sweet in some sense, right? These cricket sounds. And you can see this is at 5 and that is at 6.8. So each species not only has a unique temporal or rhythm structure, it also has a unique frequency structure. Okay? And we know from decades of work with playback experiments, meaning you record the song of the species, you play it back, and you ask if females come towards it. Then you can start manipulating these things and what we know after many years of doing this is that the rhythm of these syllables is one of the most important characteristics sometimes also the rhythm of the chirp okay and most cricket species their response is tuned in to the frequency of the call that is the female will respond best at the frequency at which the male of her species calls. Okay. So this is something we know very well from a number of experiments done in the lab. Okay. But what happens when you go outdoors? Okay. Typically, you've got a large number of species. They're all calling together, large numbers of individuals, large numbers of species. And if you go out, into a rainforest at dusk. That's basically what you hear. You hear the huge cacophony of cats. So the question really is each cricket species is targeting a particular, uh, not individual, but is targeting the females of his own species, right? but everybody's calling together. So really the question is, if everyone's calling together, then how do you pick out the correct message in this mess? Okay. So basically there's likely to be a lot of acoustic interference in the real world. And the question we tried to ask is, do they have strategies to deal with this? So you can think of the senders as having strategies, and you can think of the receivers as having strategies. I'm going to deal largely with senders. I'll talk about receivers at the end. So the idea is, what can these different senders, these different species do, to be able to convey the message uh, with minimal interference? And if you think about it, it's very analogous to the problem of your cell phone network, right? So you want to communicate with a particular individual, but the message is put out into a common medium. Everybody puts out the message into the same medium, but the receiver then has to receive one message, right? So there's an analogy there, okay? So what one imagines then is that in a community of species, right, which all have their own particular call structures, right? These call structures and where and when they call from may well be optimized to minimize acoustic interference. Okay? So maybe, uh, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit of detail. For example, senders can partition out their calling in time. Okay? And this can be at different scales. Okay? For example, and in, if you think of each of these as one species, then maybe um, species A 
will have a breeding season that is slightly different than B, slightly different than C. They could space out their breeding seasons, after all they are calling, to attract females. In reality, actually, they don't do this. Okay? Uh, typically, most of the species will all come up at the same time because they have other kinds of constraints. In India, for example, it's the wet-dry cycle. Okay? Um, so it will be remarkably quiet in April, May, except for cicadas. Then after the first rain, it will be boom, but all the species usually come up more or less together. So there's not too much scope to partition at that scale, okay? But you could partition on a circadian scale. So we could say if our calls are very similar, for example, species A calls from 7 to 8. Uh, this is just an extreme example. Species B could call from 8 to 9, another from 9 to 10. So we could have different windows, okay? Or you could partition at an even finer scale. So you're calling at the same time, but one calls for five, six minutes and keeps quiet. The other then calls in the window. So there are ways to avoid masking in time, right? Um, or you could partition yourself out in space, right? So if you can be as far apart as possible, so some those that have very similar calls, some call from the floor or some call from the canopy and so on, then also you could minimize interference. Or you could partition yourself out in spectral space. Okay? So what is this? This is just a sound recording done in the rainforest and I have made a spectrogram. What is a spectrogram? You've got time on this axis and this separates all the frequencies in the recording. And you can see these different patterns, one here at around 10, one here around 8, one here around 7, one clearly visible around 2, right? These are all different species. So you can have like radio frequency bands, you can have different species in different frequency bands. But look at this mess here at 4 to 5 kilohertz this is an interesting problem. There are very large number of species that actually call here. Okay? So for these guys, they are not using the partitioning uh, along the frequency band. Okay? So, so these are possibilities. But how do you find out what animals are actually doing? Okay? So to do that, you have to make measurements. So about almost 15 years ago now, um, we decided to look at this in um, a rainforest in Kudremukh National Park in the Western Ghats and we were being extremely ambitious because there was no ever such study on such a large natural acoustic community. Um, and this is uh, what the terrain looks like. It's not very easy terrain to work in. And you have to work at night because these animals are nocturnal. Um, but my, I, I was fortunate to have a remarkable first PhD student, Swati Devakar, and she spent about two and a half years basically tracking down insect by insect in the rainforest, making the sound recording, catching that insect. So we you know what does the call look like, who's calling, where is he calling from, okay? And at the end of that exercise, we got 20 species in one patch of forest. Um, so 10 of the true crickets, 10 of the katydids, and one of these interesting in-between guys, more about that. And just for fun, since this is, I think the nicest thing about bioacoustics has to be sound. So let me play some of these calls to you. So this is a guy who lived on the forest floor and he lived only in dead logs, only dead logs. Okay. Um, very typical cricket, uh, around 45 kilohertz. This is another one who lives on the floor, but this will sound very different. Can you 
your house, the candles. The reason it's so rough is because it's got a lot of frequency. So it's very, very noisy. Okay? There is a relative of this who lives on our campus. You should listen for it in July. When the monsters come, July or September, you hear them in the main court line. Um, this is a false leaf, a very beautiful You'll be able to hear it, it's a much higher frequency, I'll try and play it. I'm not sure you can hear it, it's, it's around 12 to 13 kilohertz, okay? Then another very beautiful false case is, so I have to tell you some interesting stories. This is the animal that took me to Kudrin, okay? So, I spent the first two years of my time here walking up and down the Western Ghats. There was a lot of fun, I never had such fun after. Uh, and, <laughs> yes, listening for calls. And this guy drove me crazy. Okay, coming from the tree canopy. And you when know, you hear it in the dead of night, in the forest, you know, you have a clue what it is. Is it a frog? Is it a bird? Or is it a cricket? And I had a bet with my students, and we spent a week tracking this guy. And at the end of it, Yes, we found them, and yes, it was a cricket. Um, this was another amazing animal, and for about three years, we are high in the canopy, um, we thought they were frogs. Right, the moment when the sun goes down, 
If it marks that fish is B, that fish is C, that fish is D, and so on. And if you do that exercise, you'll come up with yet another matrix. And a final component here, probability that the this animal is calling, it is actually being marked by another who's calling at the same time. Okay? All right. We can then change our dimension and look at the spectral domain, that is the frequency. So just to give you an example, here is the frequency spectrum of one species. I don't know how many can see this blue. It's very narrow band. This is the frequency spectrum of the map. Okay. So you can ask how much overlap is there between the frequency spectrum. This is similar to what I showed you in the spectrogram, the different frequency paths. Okay. But you can compute it more um, accurately if you actually use so again, all our different calls have different spectral structure, so we can compare each species with every other species and see how much overlap there is. What I'm going to show you in the next slide is simply these matrices. All I've done is take all these numbers and plot them. Okay? Make a frequency histogram. So I'm going to ask how many zeros are there, how many fall between 0 and 10, how many fall between 10 and 20, and so on.
from a perceptual life, not just from the signal. So what's missing? There's another very important dimension that's missing here, and that is space. I told you about space. Space also has a huge effect on how much money we have. So we decided to go in and begin to look at space, and we began quite simply looking at vertical space, vertical space. Basically, who's calling at which height? And when you do that, you find, of course, subspecies called only from the ground, some call just above the ground. So these are like individuals with the species and the height at which they're falling. And there are, you know, canopy animals who fall from way up above the ground. Again, this doesn't tell you how much musket. For example, an animal might be really, really loud. So even though it's far away, you might still get it. Or they might be two animals very close to each other, but they may separate in time, right? So you've got to look at all of these axes together. The question was, how do we get to that? To get to that, yes. That's because in the trees, you've got trees of many different, you know, there are different kinds of trees, and trees of very different height. So the moment you are above about 10 meters, you will get huge error bars because some trees are very tall and maybe the animals don't get too much within a tree than other yeah, the my case. Yeah. Alright, so what do you need to know if you actually want to find out something about what an animal might be experiencing in terms of mass Okay? Alright, so let's take two colors. They are two different species. Okay? A is calling from this point in space. B is calling from here, different height, at a certain distance apart. Question I want to know is if I am a female of A, okay, what's the probability that I will hear A alone or I will hear A plus B? Okay? What is that dependable? That is that first on how far it falls propagates and what do we mean by that? As sound goes propagates away, you know it at any rate. But as you go further away, the time will come when you will not hear the sound. Okay. Now I can compute how long it takes before I don't hear the sound. And for fun I usually do that. Okay. From how far can I hear it? Okay. But that doesn't tell me what I want to know. It doesn't tell me from how far can the second okay, of species X or species Y. So how far up? If you think of this as sound emanating and going out into the stratosphere, yeah? okay? What is the point at which the cricket will not hear it anymore? Okay. Now if we really wanted the answer, we'd have had to measure the hearing pressures of every one of these insects which we didn't have the time at that point to do. So we assumed the hearing threshold of 40 decibels. And the reason we assumed that is there's a huge literature, a huge neurophysiology literature on the protest that have measured hearing thresholds on many of the Whole part yeah, of that is about 35 to 45, so we took the average of 40. Okay? As we can be very far, we take 40. So you compute, you only have to compute is how loud is this call, and at what point does it attenuate to fall. And the reason these two circles are different is because not only is this call of a different intensity, of a different loudness, but it's also got a different structure, and this will affect how far out it is coming. So you've got these spheres of influence. This tells you the volume of space in which a female of A might hear, and this will tell you the volume of space in which a female of B might hear B. And the intersection is where they're likely to hear both. Okay. So to compute these intersections, we needed to know where animals were, how loud they were, how their calls attenuated, and um, something about their hearing, as I said, we made some assumptions. But we compute.
like to know is what with some effect, you know, what's the probability of having some polyp. And the main thing is, so we were stuck on this for two years, so we could run these multiple sphere intersections. Um, but we had a very, very bright computer engineer who cracked how to do this. Okay? So finally, we were able to figure out if you have multiple neighbors, what's the sound effect of all of them? Okay? What's the probability of interference? And you can now ask that for individual species A standing here, individual species B standing here, in real forests. And when you do that, then what you get here is how many times, let's say I sampled 50 of individuals of this species in natural forests, <coughs> how many times do I get zero, how many times do I get 10%, how many times do I get And to our huge surprise, most of the modes and all of the medians <coughs> are actually at zero, okay? I've worked. 15 years in this business, and I would never have predicted this, okay? So when we did all of these numbers, and we really couldn't believe it, many, many, many of them came out to be zero. Basically, it means we believe that they are living in a far more silent world, okay? Now, why do we think it's a cacophony? That's because we're using our ears to listen in to them. Um, so, what we learned by this exercise was that the cacophony that we hear and that I played you in the beginning of the talk in the rainforest may be no cacophony whatsoever if you are one of the insects that in there. It, it is exactly the concept of the right? So, the world as an animal perceives it and not the world as you perceive it. Okay? And how come we were the first people to get these kinds of results? Well, we're the first people who try to look at the masking problem from a perceptual angle and to take all of the things, or most of the things, that once you take into account. So we could combine timing, spacing, frequency separation, structure of the ball, transmission, loudness, right? Unless you combine all of these, you cannot even really begin to estimate. <coughs> okay? um, so at least from our simulation, based on a lot of data, it seems that the forest is a much quieter place that we believe it is for the animals who are actually in there communicating with each other. But, to be really sure about that, we need to go in and check the things we assumed, right? We assumed things like hearing sensitivity. We assumed things like how they're tuned into frequencies. When we model these. So we made a start with that, and I started with uh, one of my favorite uh, members of the community, which is this anti so basically, we're now trying to go to the other side and asking what are the hearing, right? Each of them, the ears. So as I told you, to remind you, this has this very sweet pure tone call.
So I'll read it out for you. Um, you should actually... No, I just want to get rid of that. Ah, okay. Right. So, what does he say? Our own experience provides the basic material for our imagination, whose range is therefore limited. Right? It will not help to try to imagine that one has webbing on one's arms, so this is a bat, right? Yeah. Which enables one to fly around at dusk and dawn, catching insects in one's mouth. That one has very poor vision and perceives the surrounding world by a system of reflected high frequency sound signals. And that one spends the day hanging upside down by one's feet in an attic. Okay? Insofar as I can imagine this, which is not very far, it tells me only what it would be like for me to behave as a bat. Okay? But that is not the question. I want to know what it is like for a bat to be a bat. Yet if I try to imagine this, I am restricted to the resources of my own mind and those resources are inadequate to the task. Um, to the extent that I could look and behave like a wasp or a bat, without changing my fundamental structure, my experiences would not be anything like the experiences of those animals. Um, even if I could by gradual degrees be transformed into a bat, nothing in my present constitution enables me to imagine what the experiences of such a future stage of myself thus metamorphosed would be like, right? So the best evidence would come from the experiences of bats. 
if we only knew what they were like. Okay, I think that's a beautiful summary of the problem. Okay, and um, I like this article because it is uh, argued over and over again by both philosophers and neurobiologists who are always very optimistic that one day you know we will crack this. Okay, that we'll actually be able to understand this whole issue of perception. Okay, and uh, it's something that I think we need to think about. Okay, um, philosophers argue that it is essentially impossible. Okay, and that's actually where I want to leave you that the umbelt is the elusive holy grail. 